Everybody, it's Tyler here at Chessie Champs. Well, check in with the host team, 254. Cheesy Poofs coming in. One of the favorite robots every single year is to come through here. Of course, we'll be looking at their absolutely gorgeous robot, talking about everything that's gone into it, both on some programming side and also mechanical side as well. So strap right in. Let's learn more about 254 coming up here on Behind the Bumpers. This video on fun was brought to you by viewers like you and also by the following. Discover how you can graduate debt-free at Kettering University with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more, schedule a visit, or apply. The new Robit system by Anymark can reduce complexity and enable robust builds. Parts align to a common one half inch grid, simplifying construction and allowing alignment of both structure and motion components. Robits enables teams to always have the parts they need to complete a build. Head on over to Anymark.com slash Robits to learn more in order today. Obby, let's start out, kind of go from the ground up here. We'll talk about your drive base and start to work uh, your way up through uh, some of the uh, interestingly named mechanisms that you have. So talk to me more about it. Yeah, so uh, to begin with the drive base, um, so for this year, this is our second year doing Swerve. So we went with the SDS uh, ELF 3 modules, uh, the inverted ones. And we actually made a few modifications to make it easier for us to traverse through the entire field and then also over some of the ridges and the bridge. Um, so we can start over here. So as you can see with this plate, um, it's blue anodized, but then it's also steel. And there's a big chamfer on the side, which basically just helped us go over the bridge and then the big bump. And in addition to that, we also have these little wedges that go over the wheels, and that's in addition to help us go over the bridge and the bump. Um, and that also just takes some of the strain off of the sword modules as a whole. So our frame perimeter for this year is actually 26.5 by 26.5 inches, which is a bit smaller than we usually do um, in previous years. And as you can see with the rest of the subsystems that we'll talk about, it's mainly just to save weight and then also just make sure that our robot can go as fast as possible. Um, so we generally go with box tubing. Um, and if you come to the front over here, um, this, uh, this front frame rail is actually solid aluminum. We had originally went with uh, 16th inch, but then we found that that bent in a lot, and same with 8th inch. So eventually we just said, let's just go with solid, and then that way, whenever, you, whenever we're going to the double substation, we can slam right up against the wall, and there's no damage. When did you make those changes? Was that like a mid-season change you discovered that? Yeah, because after our drivers were practicing and we were doing a lot of test matches and just like actual matches um, during competition, we realized that the frame rail was bending in a lot, and we had to replace it constantly. So eventually we just said, we have have some weight we might as well put it lower down so let's just put it in the front and then make sure that we never bend our frame rails again it's definitely working you know, i just watched your last match out yeah. there and you got to be probably the loudest robot going in uh slamming the substation and definitely working out for you well yeah and in addition to that also just helping with weight we also have two more uh two more belly pans underneath our first one so we have eighth inch aluminum and then two eighth inch um uh steel plates yeah we basically call it an oreo because it's blue and then white and then blue. <laughs> all right yeah. Uh, as we keep moving on through your robot, talk to me about uh, some of the mechanisms as we start looking at acquisition of game pieces. Yeah, so probably one of the main uh, mechanisms over here is the elevator. So these are the elevator uprights, and this is the carriage. So this pretty much controls our, all of our scoring, all of our piece acquisition, and everything else. Um, and then we'll talk about the laterator a bit. But this elevator is one stage and is driven by a belt in the back. And as you can see, there's a lot of supports, there's a lot of crossbars, because what we found is that with such big uprights, there was a lot of twisting going on and it would take a lot of impacts. And I mean, we try to design our robots to basically take a big hit. Um, so that's why there's a lot of like uh, stiffening and also just plates to make sure that everything's completely secure. And that's the same with these um, A-frames over here that go down to the drive base. You mentioned uh, you, you uh, did a lot of testing in regards to the, the, the torsion as well on the elevator. Was that something you found out in design or was that kind of a, just a trial by event for you? Uh, that was more when we were practicing because the elevator was one of the first subsystems that we actually put on um, and started testing with and we found that it was really not uh, stiff and it was just really easy to twist and bend and break. We even had some A-frames bend um, when we were taking impacts and welds break and stuff like that. Uh, talking about the uh, laterator, we got to talk a little more about that. Yeah, so this is the laterator. This is basically a lateral elevator. Um, so it's three stages, um, as you can see here, and they're all carbon fiber tubing with uh, carbon fiber end caps over here as well. And um, the way that we made this is we wanted to go as fast as possible. So we went with cascade rigging, which just means that all the stages go out at once instead of one at a time. And we found that that works really well. Additionally, is that the laterator is at an angle so that when we do go straight into the substation, we're able to slam right up against the wall. And that's a little different than some angled elevators because, they, um, because it's a little slower to go up and then line up. 
something I was going to say just uh, once again, watching your matches here at, at Chesney and at Championships as well too, is, is watching your uh, your delivery just seems so smooth as you go through that whole process. So you can really see how well thought out that is with this as well too. So just huge uh, huge kudos to uh, 254 and what you've designed as well too with this. Uh, anything else on the ladder you want to cover at all? Uh uh, that's mainly it. We just wanted to carbon fiber because it was light and strong, and that's mainly, you'll see that throughout the rest of our robot. Yeah, you can see how well that works with your CG, and we talked about your belly pan earlier. Uh, Diego, I know we're going to be covering uh, a bit more in regards to uh, your ground intake, uh, the claw, and, and of course the forks as well, too, we got to talk about. Uh, so talk to me more, uh, whatever you want to start out with. Yeah, so our principle or our philosophy going into the season was touch it, own it, and being as quick as possible to the driver station. So we wanted to go in, slam against the wall, the cone is fully grafted and secured in there, and it sort of led to us going with a very familiar architecture, so if you want to pan over here, we went with a very similar to our 2019 intake, where two horizontal rollers, but then the very cool about this year's intake is that we actually wanted to grasp the, the cone as firmly as possible, so we have these articulating arms that would then move as the cone comes in and then latch onto it. So if I do grab a cone over here. So this is a demonstration of how the cone would be once it's actually grabbed in there. And then it's pretty snug in there. And then the great part about this is that it doesn't fall off while moving and then we can go down, slam it, and it just pulls itself and pries itself out of there. And then in order to accompany this when picking up ground or cubes from the ground, we came and iterated on this ground intake. So initially we never had this on the robot architecture. We thought that our intake would be very good at grabbing cones. Sure. But when we went to approach cones, they would just bounce off the intake. So we added this top roller to help center the, in, uh, the cubes as they came in and also just make them stick to the ground. So something cool about this intake is that it has no bearings when it comes to the lateral movements. It's all Teflon sliders and 3D printed blocks, which is some technology that we're hoping to innovate in the future because it's great with weight savings and reductions. <laughs> Additionally, when we, uh, when we wanted to ta uh, focus on the end game part of the, r of the match, we went about it in two ways. The first was trying to be the most quick out on the, or the last one on the field and the, first, and the last one to climb. So that led us to three philosophies. One of them was being very good at balancing, which software will talk about, and the other was the implementation of these forks. So if we go back here, we can sort of walk through how we approach the forking situation. So multiple teams, like 1678, they're all about getting their forks in there and tilting up. However, their robots are very low to the ground and don't have any protrusions that stick up, so they can actually fully pivot the full 180 degrees. However, our robots, since we have the giant elevators, we can't really do that pivoting motion. So we went with a more vertical extension, um, which some of our matches highlight and we'll be highlighting later in our actual demonstration. But the actual climbing is done on a couple of rods, carbon fiber rods, and then this whole piece articulates down, and then we lift ourselves up, and we'll demonstrate that later on. Yeah, definitely. As you mentioned, we'll be getting to that in just a little bit. Uh, first off, though, let's go to uh, Ayush, uh, talk about uh, what you're doing for uh, autonomous other program aspects, and of course, we'll do that uh, demonstration, too. Uh, yeah, so for as for Auton, we do have uh, several consistent Autons on both bump side and non-bump side, as well as going over the bridge. Uh, so our first Auton, which is a bump side, we have bump side, which we can do one high cone, and then we do a high cube, and then a uh, mid cube. Um, so in order to generate these uh, points and how we do the Auton, so we first create points that we want the robot to pass on its way, on its trajectory, um, and then after that we create a spline, which will calculate what trajectory we want to take between those points in the most optimal fashion. And in order to tr uh, correct for this, uh, the error uh, throughout the path, uh, we will use PID tuning. Um, so we use PID as well as spline generation to create our trajectories and follow them. Um, and that works really well for us in uh, following the path uh, uh, on both bump side and uh, uh, non-bump side. And as for uh, the bridge auton, we do have a bridge auton which can do two pieces as well and balance on the bridge. So our bridge uses uh, the values from the gyro to balance it as well in motion profiling. How are you setting up your autonomous modes? Are you using some sort of GUI interface or like what do you, what do you use when you're actually going to be uh, setting what autonomous you're going to be uh, doing? Is it something oh, on your driver station we so can show? So yeah, we have a chooser uh, which can choose which auton we're going to do and it'll also uh, adjust based on which uh, side we're on, so red or blue. Perfect. So we can choose which auton. Yeah, and can we see, uh, can we run through a full like uh, cycle on your robot and yeah, demonstrate sure. how this awesome machine works? Okay, uh, so one of the main things that we do whenever we run a system check in our pit here is that we'll test our intakes um, by checking on the ground. So we'll start with the cone. And then we go to the different scoring positions. So low, mid, and then high. And then we'll score. And, yeah. and then we'll do the same thing for a cube. Uh, 
Uh, so now we're going to test our forks. So one way that we do this is we have a piece of wood that's about the bridge's height. Um, and then whenever we deploy the forks, we just want to test that it's ending at that right height. So we can do forks. Yeah, so after deploying them, now we're going to check um, the actual height to make sure that it's above the bridge at least. And then we're going to actually bring the forks down as if we're climbing. Yeah. So in the overall, by the way, this testing is something you do pre-match every single match, right? Yeah. Uh, so when you're looking at you know, advice for other teams as well, too, uh, what advice do you have for teams in regards to like doing your pre-match checklist that maybe other teams can take from you guys? Yeah, I'd say one of the main things that we do is we have one way of doing things, as in everybody on our pit crew has um, checklists that they go through for every single subsystem. Um, so we have some full system che checklists, we have one for the drive base, um, we have one for the elevator. So everybody knows which subsystem they're supposed to check in um, as soon as the robot comes in, so they'll always be checking that. And in addition to that, consistency is one of the main things that we try to instill in our pit crew. So we try to do things the same way over and over again and just getting better at it and knowing what to look for. I think one of the last things we have to wrap up here is you have one of the most iconic pits in first. You know, whenever you go the championships or anything else, I mean, the crowds that 254 brings to it, I think it's cool. So I think we should show off some of the key features here for those at home. I uh, want to see a little bit more of what you do uh, and how you organize. This is an absolutely gorgeous pit that you have. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I guess um, one of the main things is that we have these eight foot long worktops. Um, so we have three of these and they're meant to hold uh, all sorts of tools, drill bits. Um, we call these thin bins. So we have thin bins storing a bunch of parts, both general and uh, subsystem specific. So you're specific. So like you can see here, we have uh, spares for the laterator. Um, and then we also just have these shelves that can then be dropped down and actually stored on top of this. So everything collapses down and that's how we're able to transport it. We just uh, strap everything down and then we're able to push these carts um, wherever we need to go. Um, it's the same on this side. These bins are just more general as well, but with some subsystem specific ones as well. And we can just bring everything down, strap it all up, and then we're able to push them. Um, and then we have our truss um, with the lights. So. This truss uh, breaks down into a few pieces, and we don't have them here, but we have some wooden holders that um, hold uh, at least four legs at a time, and that's how we transport those. And then they can sit on top of these uh, pieces of metal, because these bars, um, the truss wooden pieces have little legs that can then just latch onto that, and that's we just put them all on top. So then all we really have to do is just push these carts along, and it brings our entire pit with us. So are we going to see like a public 254 pit so other teams can uh, start building this, like the high tide one? Um, we, we're not sure about re uh, releasing it because a lot of this was just kind of on the fly. Like, this would be cool. Let's just yeah. kind of add it. And I'm just putting it on the spot there, man. Yeah. An absolutely okay. phenomenal uh, pit and a phenomenal team as well, too. 254, uh, congratulations uh, for all the success you had. And thanks for being a big inspiration to the first community as well. We look, can't wait to see a course I do here at Chessie, but looking for the crescendo season for you, too. Thanks a lot. This video on fun was brought to you by viewers like you and also by the following. The new Robit system by Anymark can reduce complexity and enable robust builds. Parts align to a common one half inch grid, simplifying construction and allowing alignment of both structure and motion components. Robits enables teams to always have the parts they need to complete a build. Head on over to Anymark.com slash Robits to learn more in order today. Discover how you can graduate debt-free at Kettering University with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more, schedule a visit, or apply. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Most live shows can be found on the First Updates Now YouTube channel, live competitions at twitch.tv slash firstupdatesnow, and join our Discord at discord.gg slash firstupdatesnow. Check our other social offerings on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter.